Hey, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Sonoma Valley Church of the Nazarene. Thanks for coming out today. Hey, in 1936, Dale Carnegie wrote a book, Winning Friends and Influencing People. Now, I'll admit that I've never actually read the book, but I wanted to ask you this morning to think about someone in your life who's had a huge influence on you, someone other than your mother or your father. Take a moment and think about that person. Who was it? Can you give that person a name? Well, what kind of person were they? My guess was that they were people with integrity, people who were intentional, who moved through life with purpose, people who spoke thoughtfully and who listened, people who were always learning, and people who were focused on things that really matter. Now, I'll tell you what doesn't influence people, and that is arguing with them on Facebook. Last week, Jesus told his disciples that a prophet is not without honor, except in his own hometown. And I would be tempted to argue with Jesus this point, because Israel has a history of killing their prophets. Because God doesn't usually send prophets unless the people aren't already listening. Prophets are called by God to push back against the status quo, to speak against godlessness on behalf of God. And this doesn't usually sit well with people, which leads us to this week. Just a couple of weeks ago, we learned that John the Baptist was in prison. John found himself in prison because he was not afraid to speak truth to power. And in chapter 14, where we find ourselves today, it begins with the story of Herod. Now, this is not Herod the Great, who sent his soldiers to kill every child under the age of uh, two Excuse me, uh, when Jesus was born in Bethlehem. That Herod died 30 years earlier. This is one of his sons, Herod Antipas, who he had set up to rule in his place when he passed away. But Herod wasn't a real king. And although he is ethnically part Jewish, he's also kind of middle management for the Roman Empire. And with Lent approaching, I wondered if I shouldn't this week pause from our gospel story and tell a wilderness one. But I decided not to, to stick with the gospel this week. Plus, nothing says Lent quite like the beheading of a prophet. (laughs) Wouldn't you agree? All right, well, maybe not. But when Herod hears the stories of Jesus, he thinks that maybe this is John the Baptist who's come back from the dead. Let's open up with a word of prayer, and then we'll take a look at our passage together. Lord, we are your, your gathered church, formed and called by you as we open up your sacred text today. I pray that you would meet us in this place, that we would hear your voice, that you would speak to us and be our teacher. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, as I mentioned, today you can find our scripture reading in chapter 14, beginning in verse 1, where we read, At that time, Herod the Tetrarch heard the report about Jesus, and he said to his attendants, This is John the Baptist. He's risen from the dead. That is why these miraculous powers are at work in him. Now Herod had John arrested and bound him in prison because of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife. For John had been saying to him, it is not lawful for you to have her. Herod wanted to kill John, but he was afraid of the people because they considered John a prophet. And on Herod's birthday, the daughter of Herodias danced for the guests and pleased them so much that he promised with an oath to give her whatever she asked. And prompted by her mother, she said, Give me on a platter the head of John the Baptist. Now the king was distressed, but because of his oath and his dinner guests, he ordered that her request be granted. And he had John beheaded in prison. And he brought his head in on a platter and gave it to the girl who carried it to her mother. And John's disciples came and took his body and buried it. And then they went and they told Jesus, This is the word of the Lord to you. Thanks be to God. Well, this is how the story goes. Herod Antipas is having a not-so-subtle extramarital affair with his brother Philip's wife. Herodias, that's her name, and Herod decide to get divorces from their spouses in order to remarry each other. And everybody's happy, right? Well, not everyone. What about Herod's first wife? She's not happy. She has to go back to her father after being rejected by her husband, who wasn't really a king in the first place. And the first wife's father, he's not happy either. And he really is a king. And as the marriage begins to dissolve, so does the relationship between these two leaders. And Herod's ex-father-in-law attacks Herod's territory 
and Herod is going to come out on the losing end of this battle. Now, you won't find this part of the story in the Bible. We get this from the historical records of guys like Josephus, who was a Jewish historian. But you know who else isn't happy? God. And you might wonder, does God's word have anything to say about all of this? Well, it does. In Leviticus chapter 18, and again in chapter 20, we hear things like, you will not uncover the nakedness of your brother's wife. It is his nakedness. And again, if a man marries his brother's wife, it is indecent. Now, parentheses, except in the cases of a Leverite marriage, which is not something that is part of our story today, and so I'm going to just pass on that part. So there's that. So do you think it is a good idea that John should mention to Herod how unhappy God is? Well, John thinks so. And if you haven't noticed by now, John is not a subtle man. He's going to speak out against this adultery and against this remarriage because it falls outside of the law of Moses. And so John calls out Herod for his sin. Now, Herod's upset, but this might be more than just hurt feelings. Herod might have seen this as a political attack. <clears throat> and so he's upset, his wife's upset, and he has John arrested and thrown in prison where he hopes he will rot there. And then the scripture says, although Herod wanted to kill him, he feared the crowd because they thought that John was a prophet. And it would seem that John has friends in low places. He's popular with the common folk, but not so much with the religious leadership. And then Herod decides to throw himself a birthday party. Now, throwing yourself a party is not really something that, that, that they did in that culture. But Herod has a celebration with the men in one banquet hall, and the prominent women in yet another. And Herodias sends her daughter over to entertain the male guests. So this would be Herod's niece. And the scripture says that she was impressive, that Herod was quite entertained and motivated by his niece. And then Herod swore to give her anything that she asked for. The thinking here is that he might have been just a little hammered at the time, because he actually didn't really have the authority to give her very much. But the daughter goes back to her mother to come up with an ask. And, and they come up with this idea. Give me the head of John the Baptist on a plate. Which you might think might just be an expression. But it wasn't. This is exactly where the expression comes from. And Herod is too embarrassed to, fulfill his drunk, to not fulfill his drunken promise in front of his guests. And so he does. Now the question that I want to ask myself is this. What is John called by God to do? And I would submit to you that John was called by God to point to the arrival of a Jewish Messiah, to announce that God was about to do a new thing, and to call people to prepare their hearts for this new thing that God was going to do. So do we think that it was John's job to confront individuals about their personal sin, to call them out publicly and personally? Yeah, I don't think so. Whose job is it to convict people of their sin? Well, I'm going to argue that it's the job of the Spirit of Christ, the Holy Spirit, to convict the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment, to guide us in all truth, to dwell within us, to be a source of revelation, of wisdom, and of power, to sanctify believers so that they might bear good fruit, and to mark us and to seal us as belonging to Christ. One of the big turnoffs to our faith is how judgmental people perceive us to be. And what does Jesus say about judging? He says, judge not, lest you also be judged. For with the same measure that you judge others, that judgment will be used on you. So whose job is it to judge? <clears throat> well, Jesus says that all judgment has been given to him. And you and I, we are to speak into people's lives with permission, through relationship, with love, and with respect. So then what's the purpose of the law? Well, Paul will tell the church in Rome that the law was given to the people of God, not others, but to the people of God, to reveal their sin and to expose their need for a Savior. It was to be a lamp unto our feet, a guide for life as to how to live with God and with other people. So is it our job to be the moral police? Or is it our job to be people of integrity, people who are intentional, who move through life with a purpose, who speak thoughtfully and who listen to others, People who are always learning and are focused on things that really matter. It's your job and it's my job to live a life that is holy and pleasing, to uphold Jesus as the model for such a life. That's what it means to do justly 
to love mercy and to walk humbly. We must recognize that each of us is on a spiritual journey and that that journey is a process and that not all of us begin in the same place. And my friend Ron and former co-pastor, he used to always say that we are a church of healthy families, but we don't care where you start. So is there a time to stand up for social justice and to be and to speak truth to power? I'm going with a big yes. But like John, we need to know that it's going to cost us. It's easier and probably less dangerous to do so as a collective body of believers through nonviolent demonstrations or respectful conversations. But sometimes the spirit of Christ compels us. And when that happens, we've got to act. So when is it appropriate to do so? Well, I think it's appropriate to do so when it involves human degradation, injustice of any kind, genocide, or crimes against humanity. Do we have example of modern prophet types who acted when God called them to do so? Yeah, we do. We've got people like William Wilberforce, who was an early English abolitionist, or John Newton, who was a repentant former slave ship owner, who later wrote the hymn Amazing Grace. Or Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who stood up against Adolf Hitler for his annihilation of the Jews in Nazi Germany. Desmond Tutu, who was an anti-apartheid activist in South Africa. And of course, Martin Luther King, who was a civil rights leader right here in the United States. But there are also many examples of women of faith, too, like Baldina and Perpetua, and more recently, like Kayla Mueller, whose stories I don't really have time to tell today. But these are just a few of the people who, were felt, who felt called by God to speak out against human degradation, injustice, genocide, and crimes against humanity. But these people were not calling out individuals for their personal sin. And when the scripture talks about seeing your brother caught in a sin and then going to that person, the scripture encourages you to do so privately. But the sin that they are talking about, at least in that context, has to do with personal offenses between two individuals that will disrupt the unity of their fellowship. But notice this also, that all those who are motivated by the Spirit of God to speak out against these kinds of injustices paid for it dearly. But empowered by the Spirit of Christ, they were willing to, and to bear any and all of that cost. This kind of conviction goes well beyond moral courage. These are people who were living fully into their faith. And when Paul wrote to the church in Galatia, he said, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives within me. And the life that I now live in the body, I live by faith. Indeed, by the faithfulness of God's Son who gave himself for me. Our lives are about doing what God is doing. So what is the role of faith in my life? Well, it's to give me reason for hope to provide me with a hopeful future, to provide me with a reason for being, a, a mission and a purpose, to help me reach my full human potential, to connect with God, to connect with others, so that we could be a blessing unto the world. And where this leads might be different for each of us. Most of us will live relatively simple lives that impact a small number of intimate friends and family. And that is perfectly okay. Others might be called to more heroic and selfless acts. And when the apostles were called by God to follow Jesus, the decision to follow him, they had no idea where that might lead them. So whatever happened to Herodias and Herod? Well, it turns out they did go to Rome, and they went to tell the emperor that Herod should be addressed as king and not as tetrarch. But that didn't go over so well. And Herod was so much of a bother that Rome decided to get rid of both of them. Now, the Apostle Peter will one day tell us that all of us should clothe ourselves with humility toward one another because God opposes the proud, but he favors the humble. Humble yourself, therefore, under the mighty hand of God that he may lift you up at the appropriate time. Meanwhile, back at the ranch, Jesus, remember Jesus? This is a story about Jesus. When we last left him, he was discouraged yet determined, disillusioned because those who had heard his words and seen his miraculous deeds were not responding to the good news of God's kingdom. And when he hears about John's death, he retreats to a, in, by boat to a private place to be alone. But the crowds, 
follow him on foot. And when Jesus lands on the shore, a large crowd has, has already arrived and he has compassion on them and he heals their sick. And as the evening approaches, the disciples come to him and said, Lord, send them away. We're in a remote place so that they might go back and find some food. And Jesus replied, they don't need to go away. You give them something to eat. This is a discipleship moment. And they respond, but we've only five loaves of bread and two fish. And then Jesus says, bring them here. And he directed the people to sit down on the grass. And taking the, the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up into heaven. He gave thanks, he broke the loaves, and then he gave them to his disciples, and the disciples gave them to the people, and all who ate were satisfied. Blessed, broken, and given. I hope that sounds familiar. And the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over, and the number of those who were fed was 5,000, not including the women and the children. So again, we see Jesus' humanity. Jesus is clearly shaken by the death of his ministry partner and his cousin John, and he retreats to a private place to grieve. But his popularity among the people, with those who have ears to hear, makes his alone time hard to come by. And seeing the crowds that followed, he has compassion on them. Now, in this section of, the, of Matthew's gospel, between chapters 14 and 20, we're going to uh, see that people have different expectations about a Messiah. And Jesus continues to heal the sick. And twice he miraculously feeds huge crowds of people. And on this occasion, he, he feeds in an exclusively Jewish crowd. But the next time, it'll be a non-Jewish or a mixed crowd. And these events are similar to those that Moses did for the people in the wilderness, which, of course, continues to please those who already see Jesus as a great prophet and as a messiah but not the religious leaders who have a completely different and political view of how a Messiah would one day be their savior. And from their point of view, Jesus is a false teacher who's making blasphemous claims about himself. And so in response, Jesus withdraws and he begins teaching his closest disciples what it means for him to be Israel's Messiah. Because what Jesus thinks is not what others expect. And this is why our witness is so important. Because what people think about the church as a window into the kingdom of God will have a direct effect on what people uh, think of, ultimately think about Jesus. So let's close in prayer. Lord, help us to be people of grace, people who can walk in the paths of righteousness, people who can summon the strength, the perseverance, and the determination to finish well. Help us to be the reason that people turn to you in hope. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you might abound in love. Thanks for coming, being with me today. God bless you. Go in peace. Stand the test.
here on earth and ever For you've shown me how it's my true home When it's all been said When it's all been said and done, there is just one thing that matters. Did I do my best to live for truth? Did I live my life for you? Lord, I live my life.